this morning. I want to, uh, um, I think I'm going to do part of it this way through this, this, uh, these, uh, these slides, and I think I'm just going to wing it on the, less, le- uh, on the rest of it. That's okay. I mean, we're going to go through a Bible verse, and we can go through the Bible verse pretty clearly. Can you, can you hear me? Hello, 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 hello. I don't know why. Maybe I just need to talk louder. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. All right. Well, let's uh, let's pray. He- Heavenly Father, as we uh, as we turn our attention to this, Your Word, and uh, and uh, the one who teaches it to us, um, Doctor Ferguson. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, open our ears and give us understanding of, of things that are, that are wonderful and yet perhaps uh, things that we might, we might not have heard before or, uh, or might find troubling or might find um, hard to understand. Lord, bless us in this so that we might lift up Christ, follow him more more closely and dearly as we, uh, as we live this life. And we pray this in, in Christ's name. Amen. We are in the whole Christ, legalism, antinomianism, and gospel assurance, why the marrow controversy still matters. Now, I want to, I want to make sure that we know where we are. We have finished the first three tra- chapters all about the grace of God and its and it's offer to all, it's free offer, and we'll have something else to say about that in just a minute. But then after that is the, uh, is the, uh, the, the legalism and the, and the antinomianism. These are words we're going to start defining, okay? We're going to go slowly through this. We're going to start defining them, and we're trying to do this in a way that it will stick, and I have more to say about that in a minute. So we're on these two, and we notice that there's a lot of chapters there. There's five chapters out of the 11 in the book, so it's a, it's a good chunk of the material is, are on these two uh, subjects, the uh, legalism and antinomianism, which we begin today. Um, I want to say something, first of all, for your encouragement in this, and, it, and it's, it's just simple. It's like this. I noticed this a couple weeks ago, if you turn to chapter 4, which we are in today, um, uh, you come to a section called Biblical Theology, Covenant, and Law on page 75 and following. And uh, he will say things like this on page 76. Um, let me get that. Why then the law? And he will say, throughout his ministry, Paul's ministry, he regularly encountered two wrong answers. One led to legalism by smuggling the law into the gospel, and the other led to antinomianism with its implication that the gospel abolished law altogether. And when you come across that first, you're thinking, well, now, I'm not sure I understand what that is and what he's doing. But I I want you to, I do want to encourage you that, that, Ferguson is taking a step by step by step through these chapters and that we're not going to say much about why then the law today because uh, we don't have place for it yet, but I assure you that uh, later on he's going to come back to it. Not once, but many times. Like on page 162, he asked that same question. Why then the law? And so, to keep in mind, if you become a little bit discombobulated, um, remember that we're, we're going step by step, step by step, and that we will come back to, the, back to it. Now, keep in mind that if you do have questions, answer them if, uh, and, and submit them into writing so if I can't answer your question, I won't answer it. But, uh, but no, I, anything you want to ask me is fine. I, I don't really care. Now, um, the grace of God is offered... Off to all, I want to say a few more things about that before we leave it. And what I want to say is this. One of the main, uh, uh, what do you call that? The, uh, what, do you, what do you call it when you put something on a fire that starts a fire? Oh, what's that? 
Acceleration, accelerant, yeah, accelerant, yeah, yeah. The accelerant to this uh, to this book, to the problem of the of the marrow controversy, was the Octorara Creed, um, that was that we've talked about before. But they made people coming to the ministry. I believe that it is not sound doctrine to teach that we forsake sin, in order to our coming to Christ. And we've talked about that. That the grace of God, the marrow men said, is offered to all, both to the elect and the non-elect. And there are no qualifications that a person has to have, that they're required to have before they can come. Um, for instance, the, it, was about, uh, it was about election. They didn't want to give the gospel, proclaim the gospel to somebody who wasn't elect. But as we've seen, and we will see again and again and again, the proclamation of the gospel is not dependent upon or doesn't flow out of anyone's experience of the gospel, whether it be election or whether it be justification or anything else. The proclam that would be ordo salutis. Has, it's not about the ordo salutis and proclaiming the gospel in any way, shape, or form. It's about what we would call the historia salutis, the history of salvation. It's about Christ's coming. This is of first importance, that Christ uh, died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. This is of first importance, and that's be, that is the gospel that has to be proclaimed to everybody, every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth, whether we believe them to be elect or not. Now, I might be about four slides down the raise, read, but they use verses like these, the marrow men. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believes. Um, I had a, I had a fr friend of mine, an older friend of mine one time, explained to me that the actual, uh, actual Greek there was the believing ones. And, and use this to say that it was not meant for everybody, but for the believing ones, not whosoever believeth. I said, nah. But then another one, they like, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All who are weary and worn in this life, which is probably most of us. And then finally, one that we've looked at, Hebrews 7.25 Jesus, the, the gospel goes out to the whole world because Jesus Christ is able to save to the uttermost anyone who draws near to God. And, and then um, Sinclair asks ask the question, he's, he begins to, to say something we all know, that God's free grace like this, just the utter sheer free grace of God in the announcement of the proclamation and the free offer of the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone often raises the false accusation of antinomianism. We know that because that's exactly what happened in, in Romans 5, 20, and 21. Read the whole passage there, but... But now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And so that, that begs the question that was probably being, being asked of Paul and why he's answering it, is that what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And so there's this idea that, uh, that grace is so powerful that, uh, that, that it, it leads to this and it would be a false accusation of antinomianism that it doesn't matter how I live once I receive Christ. There's other definitions we'll look at, but basically that's the one we looked at. Okay, and here's where I put the free offer stuff in there. I mean, the, the uh, thing. Oh, we've, did, we've done that. The basis for proclaiming the gospel. And then um, I asked uh, Travis to take a look at the Roger Nicole article has an interesting take on the sincerity of the free offer of the gospel because sometimes when we, when we think about the free offer, uh, people have raised the question, well, you know, if you, if not, not, not even the idea of the elect or non-elect at that point, but, but if, if everybody is given the gospel and not everybody can have it, is it really, a, are you really being sincere in offering it to everybody? 
And, uh, and Roger Nicole has an interesting take. Some people, well, we're going to ask Travis to come forward and give us his expert opinion. Let me check and see. Okay, this is working. I, I wanted to do this for the benefit good, of the people good. on the yes, screen. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, first of all, Robert. I like the cup. That's a good, that's yeah, a good prop. I, I like props. that. Um, yeah. I, I appreciate your confidence in me being able to take a 500 level seminary class transcript and condense that down to something meaningful. Uh, I don't know that I'll be able to do that, but one of the the analogies, uh, and Robert and I talked before the class, all analogies break down eventually, but I think analogies about the Christian and faith break down particularly quickly because they can't presuppose God. Um, so th this idea of a well-meant and sincere offer that he's talking about in the article is basically, he uses the analogy of a, a hardware store running an ad in the Sunday paper that offers a particular deal on an appliance, a refrigerator, and do they have a, uh, the ability to uh, take all of the people who get the Sunday paper and they have enough refrigerators to fulfill that promise to, that they've made in the advertisement to 300,000 people? Do they have 300,000 refrigerators available? Uh, and the answer, of course, is no. But he, he s summarizes that uh, by saying that they would give a rain check to anybody that they could not fulfill that to, and in that way, they're, they're fulfilling the argument. And I think that's where it breaks down, honestly, because God doesn't have to give rain checks. Uh, he, has, he has the particular ability to fulfill the particular promise that he's making to his particular people. Um, and so, in that sense... Well, one thing that you could say there is that it's not the same thing, but you could say that uh, um, if... There's only, it's only given to the, the, the elect, but it's, I mean, it's given to everybody, but the only elect will respond. But it's given in such a spirit that if you come, <laughs> you'll get a refrigerator. That's if right. you come, you will get everlasting life. I think that's the way he would put it. But you're not, you're, you're, you're announcing. And he, he did say something that you didn't intend me to respond to, but I thought was really, really good at the end, which was that uh, people take issue with this idea of, God's sovereignty and election in the purpose of salvation, uh, but we live as humans with uh, presuppositions about things all the time. You know, we don't, humans aren't 12 feet tall. Humans aren't, they don't live 500 years, right? So we live within the confounds of a structure that we're not in control of every day, um, but for whatever reason, we, we kind of take those in stride, but we take issue with this thing that we're not in control of. So I thought that was a good insight. Yeah. yeah. Um, the one I used to use at, at my church about that was um, with people that argued to me about predestination. I said, who are you kidding? Have you ever been to a wedding? The whole thing's predestined. They even got tape on the floor to tell you where you got to stand. Now, you don't make any decisions for yourself. <laughs> and and, uh, and I, then I say, and that's because you were created in the image of a predestinating God. But let's look at this. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Back to today's lesson, what is legalism? I have a, a handout for you that's going to tell you that, but I specifically didn't give it to you because I don't want you to give me the answer that's on the handout. I want to know what you think legalism. Any, any takers? Yes, Brad. Brad. Adding a requirement to your salvation. Yes. Very good. Separating the law from God's character. Separating the, you read the book. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. Very good. What's that? There you go. You got it. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. Okay, so... Um, uh, all that is to say that, uh, that Dr. Ferguson gives us what he thinks is uh, one of the best of, 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 of definitions. He says the following definition of legalism by Gerhardus Voss in the work of Voss, the self-disclosure of Jesus, is where it's found. Um, you don't need to check that out and read it. Uh, 
it may be the most useful definition and description of legalism that has ever been written. Okay. Listen to this. Legalism is a peculiar kind of submission to God's law, something that no longer feels the personal divine touch in the rule it submits to. Who would like to read that again for us aloud? Slowly. Drew, would you read that aloud for us? Now, what is, what is Ferguson up to when, uh, when he, he uh, said, what is legalism? And he, he gives this definition. What is he trying to accomplish as he begins to discuss this? Well, look at this. He says this. Does the scripture support this definition? You can't answer. You can't answer. <laughs> and where do you think he would go? Well, we're going to go to two places. We're going to go two places. We're going to spend the rest of our time looking at two examples. The first one is the example he uses to show the root of legalism. The root of legalism. And he goes to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 to talk about that. And that's in your, your uh, handout. And so I can get somebody to hand these out to people. Um, then we'll, we're just going to follow his, his line of reasoning here. And I'm doing it. Does somebody have a pencil I can borrow? I'm usually, I'm usually like a, an engineer. I have a little, one of those little plastic things in my, in my, my pocket. And I've got 50 pencils and I had a single pencil this morning <laughs> to make a, to make to make notes with but um, no I've got I've got one now you don't need that back do you until after class do you okay good yeah good all right I want to take a look at this I want to take a look at it it slowly and um, if you'll see on that first if you see <clears throat> there what this is that I'm giving you is an excerpt from Sinclair Ferguson's book. If you have the book, you have it in the book. But it's an, it's an excerpt that's, that's right on the crossway. They're the publisher of the book on their website. So I, I, I just took it and copied it for you so that we could have something before us and something for you to take home so that if it's a little bit new or hard to understand, yes, here we go. Then, then you have something you can go back to and you can, you, you can get your questions with them uh, along the way. But uh, that first one is, it's as old as Eden. Okay, that's where we're going to start. And I think I'm going to take that through to this. I'm just going to, I have here for us some verses that will help us get the, the brunt of the argument that he's, he's trying to develop and uh, that he is developing and he begins with Genesis 1 and 2. And he says, when you're reading Genesis 1 and 2, what you see is a, an abundant display of God's grace. That's what you're seeing there. He's creating, but he's creating a world. A world in which uh, he will place the the crown of that creation, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, his wife, you place them in a garden, in a prepared garden, and, uh, and give them a job to do, to spread that garden over the rest of the earth, which is not garden. And that's, that's, the, that's the basic beginning of evangelism, is that idea of moving out. Um, because of the fall, we move out into the desert and not into a garden. 
But in Christ, we are now seeking to move, bring the garden back to bear until Christ returns, and it really will be here. But he says this, this is, he, said, he said, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. So that, that sets us up for Genesis 3 and the argument that she has with and what the, the Satan's trying to do. But he, it's, just, it's, it's just a wonderful display of grace. And then he, he goes to Genesis 2, and he points out <clears throat> that when you, when you look at, there's six days, there are six days in, uh, in creation, and they're all good. And he takes, he says, but that can't be what it is. It can't be just that. Because God always, always, when he's talking about blessings, it always comes in sevens. And so what's the seventh one? And so, um, uh, well, I get ahead of myself here. But he took, uh, well, I'll just go back. I don't have a verse for that one. But it's when he, he established marriage. He said it's not good for man to be alone. That was the, the uh, uh, malediction instead of the benediction. He's, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's really, really good. But uh, only six of them. And then there's that one not good. And so for man to be alone. And so he establishes marriage. And Ferguson says on the basis of that, um, he believes it's implied there that the seventh good was marriage. I think that's a nice thought. It's a very nice thought to bring it to its seven, the perfect number. And then in Genesis 2, 15 and 17, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. To work it and keep it are words that mean to work it and keep it, but they also mean to serve and guard. And these two words are used in Leviticus for that very reason. The Levites were to, were to serve and to guard. That's why it was horrendous that Adam let the, the serpent stay in the garden. It was his job to throw him out, and he didn't do it. But you, you come to, um, to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so <clears throat> there we have the display of God's grace and a command. And what Ferguson is going to say is that this command, uh, because of the fall, we don't see this command in the spirit in which it was given. And he was going to make that point in a minute. But uh, I'll hold it there but it becomes central. It is a command that he gives him. He gives him, gives it to him as his heavenly father. And then we get to Genesis 3, and there's where we have the problem. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you, are not, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Now here again, um, in the, in the, at the beginning stages, Ferguson says something that he takes as very important because of the literary style and because of the way, way things are written. Uh, he makes, says all through that Moses throughout this, this narrative is using this name, the Lord God, the Yahweh, which is God's covenant name. But when, when uh, uh, the serpent speaks, about God, he doesn't use that name. He doesn't use the name of God as the loving covenant God. Now, did Adam understand that? Moses did, and that's all we need to know. It's important because that is his name. It's his covenant name. And what is the significance that we've said over and over again, at least when Whenever I, I come to this, you'll always see me using Derek Kidner's um, uh, 
picture that he gives for that, the Lord Yahweh, right? What is that picture? It's the picture uh, from Psalm 51. It's a picture of God as a, a faithful, loving husband. That's the picture. That's what Yahweh refers to as a covenant God. And so <clears throat> with that in mind, um, he's, he's, it's that kind of God that Moses has said was, was making these things. That's his word. And that's his word, isn't it? <laughs> that's the word of Jesus speaking to you, uh, regardless of whatever else you may say. And so I think, uh, I think Ferguson's right on here. Did God actually say El? It, it's a, it's a, a more generic name of God that's used there. It is sometimes used in its plural to refer to God, Elohim. And, uh, and, um, uh, but it's did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, I don't want to come back to this, uh, so let's just try to pick this apart right now. We've said some things. The serpent was more crafty. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat? But I'm not going to go through it because I, I, didn't, I didn't yellow out the important parts, and so I don't want to take time to look for them. You go home and you can read through it. I'm just going to do it from memory, okay? And we'll do it through the text. Is that good? That's what I meant by ad-libbing, okay? All right, that's what we're going to do. So he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? What is Satan doing at that point? Planning doubt. Planning doubt. Yes. Doubt in what? God's word. Doubt in what else is, is, is Sinclair Ferguson going to be as he, he, as he keeps developing this? There's something else besides the Word of God. It is the Word of God. He is doubting the Word of God. He is going to, contra he's going to in a minute, contradict the Word of God. But from the very beginning, he's putting doubt about something. Because God just said, lavished grace upon them. You can eat from all the trees in the garden. They're all yours, except this one tree. And so he's, he's planting doubt about God's word, but also God's generosity. God's character. You see. And, and Ferguson points out the fact that that, that that idea, that double meaning of the word of God, he, and, and here's, a, here's something we can say right here. Um, we sometimes we uh, where what was that? Uh, um, let me go back. I'm on sli slide 23. Legalism, that peculiar kind of submission to God's law, something that no longer feels the personal divine touch and the rule it submits to. That's exactly what Satan's doing to Eve. Do you see that? He's, he's separating this thing. He, and he, he's going to keep separating. He's going to separate this law, this commandment, from the person of God. And he does it first by attacking his character. Did he really say you couldn't, you couldn't eat from any tree of the garden? And, and, and I think, in, I forget which lecture it was, but, but um, Ferguson talks about how that, that is something we use a lot. Gossips use that a lot. They'll come to you and they'll give you something about somebody, a juicy tidbit. And what does it do to you? It creates doubt. It creates doubt. Can you get rid of it? You keep going over and can that be true? And then all of a sudden you're thinking, I never knew he was like that. <laughs> you don't know it's true or not. But it plants that doubt in you. And that's what he's doing here. He's, he's, uh, he's coming at them that way. Now let me get back to the one we were at. Uh -uh, yeah. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Oh, that's right, I am. We're not going, we haven't gone through anything, have we? I'm sorry about that. Uh, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. He's beginning to call into question God's word and God's character, the one who gives that word. And he's going to separate that word that was given from the person of Yahweh the generous covenant God is people. You see, that's how that's going to be. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, 
But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, what is that saying? Any takers? Right. Yes. She's more restrictive, isn't she? Yes. She adds something to the Word of God, doesn't she? And uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Y- yes, yes. But he's doing it. Um, but this. Uh, but God said you should not even. You, uh, this is what she's saying, though Eve is saying that, that God said this. And so, and so what Ferguson points out, and I think it's, it's really brilliant, because what he's saying is, here is Eve the legalist. Because that's what the rabbis did. That's what the Pharisees did. They say, you got this tree of the garden, you can't eat from this tree. And in order, you know, in order to make, make sure we don't eat of this tree, you know, we better make up some more laws to make sure we don't touch it. Because if we touch it, we might be going too far. And, and, and the rabbis are full of laws like that. What's that? Don't even look, don't even look at it. Yeah, right, yeah, don't, you know, that sort of thing. And, and so she's added, to the, she's added to the word that God gave concerning it. And he, she's done it in a way that, that Ferguson says, um, her doubts have caused her to do that. I better make sure here, I might... You know, let's let's make sure that we don't we don't do what God has told us to do, and then and then it keeps going. But the serpent said to the woman, "You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil." Here again. What Satan is doing, or the serpent, 12, 9 is it? Uh, you will not surely die. It's like this. He, she, he's, he's, he's planted the doubt in her, in her and now he's, he's saying, um, he said you're going to die. You're not going to surely die. The truth is, God doesn't want you to be like he is. He doesn't really mean that. Here in his image, but he doesn't want you to be like him. He likes his place where it is. And he doesn't want you to be like God, knowing good and evil. He doesn't want to be that way. And so this is putting more doubts in her mind. She doesn't really know what to think. But then the clincher comes, according to Ferguson here. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And Ferguson, what did she do here? What does it say that she did? It's, it's easy, not a trick question. What did she do? She saw that the... Yeah, what? Yes, she did. And, and she did that by how did, she, why, how did she go about justifying it? What's gone now? What's gone is any consideration of the Word of God. Ferguson says she's, tr- she's trusting now in her eyes. <laughs> she saw that it was delight to the eyes and it was to be desired and to make one wise. And so she took and ate it. And Ferguson said that's the first rule. That, that we need to understand is we don't, make, we don't make decisions like that based on our eyes, but our ears. <laughs> I think it's a great point. She's re- and his point is here, she's really in deep trouble by now. She's flustered. She's completely gone off the path. My wife wanted me to put up a sign. We have this little, we have this little um, terraced yard and and the kids would go up there and they, they would just mangle all the little flowers that had planted up there. So I put this, this little 
series of blocks around the tree and come out like that so that they can run up and around there all they want to and climb the tree and not touch a single one of the little flowers and stuff like that. But she wanted to, to and, and following what she had at Charlotte Christian School, I used to laugh at this all the time because you go to the junior kindergarten department and you got these sidewalks everywhere and these, these signs all over the place say, stay on the Lord's path. <laughs> and, I, and I said, that's, that's and uh, you know, she said, well, you know, when the teacher says, stay off the, stay, off the, stay on that path, it becomes the Lord's path. <laughs> stay off that. And so, so she's gone off it. She's, she's, she's not staying on the Lord's path. She's judging things by her eyes and by her, her own desires for this, this fruit rather than what the Lord had said at the very beginning through this topsy-turvy turvy way in which the, Satan had played her all the way until she fell into his, uh, into his trap and he ate. And then the, the eyes of both of them were opened. And what does it mean that the eyes of both of them were opened? They saw the truth. And they knew they were in big trouble, and so they sewed these fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Okay, so here's, how he, here's the take that he puts on this particular chapter. In sum, it begins with this separating the gracious benefactor God from his word. Don't eat. It's given in a, in a, in a, in a uh, kind of atmosphere, a kind of sense in which he's looking for them to grow in their knowledge of him and their trust of him. He's not giving them this command as a mean old creator who wants to get his way. He's looking for them. He's, he's blessing them, blessing and blessing them. Everything's good. Everything's good. Bless them. And, and um, you know, he created them. He blessed them. And all of these kinds of things going on in the Bible. And so, so we don't take this commandment and say all of a sudden, sudden he's, he's being harsh to her. I mean, to, to her or Adam. It's given in the, in the context of a God who wants to... What's Deuteronomy 8 and the three mile an hour God? I led you in these 40 years, all, this, all these years. Why? Because I wanted to know what was in your heart. Do you love me? You see? And that's what he's doing here. And, uh, and she has completely failed. So, begins with legalism, and then what often happens, and here's, this, here's what he goes with it. And we, he'll develop this all along the book here. When she had disconnected, when the serpent had disconnected the law, the command not to eat the, the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil from the special benefactor, Yahweh, the loving, uh, uh, loyal husband of his people, she began to look at, at this, this fruit in this tree differently than the word of God said she was going to, and then what did she do? She, she changed from being a legalist in adding the word of God, she became an antinomian. That's his point. How is that so? Well, it's like one of the uh, people during this in the Reformation said, everybody who sins is an antinomian. <laughs> it's, it's not hard <laughs> to understand who's an antinomian. Um, when you, and what, the, what she's doing is, now you see, she, this, this tree, was, this, this fruit was a problem and now she sees it as a delight to the eyes that it's going to give her something outside of what God has commanded her to do. And she, she takes it and she, and she eats it. And she gave some to her husband. Now, you think, you think about that for a minute. I knew what I would find when I went there. Um, I knew what I would find when I went there. And I just took the first one I got. I had heard this so much when I was at a local liber uh, 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 liberal college in the mid-80s in Charlotte taking classes in humanities and intellectual history, and I'd heard this in class many times, and I'd seen it at that time. It was a hot issue, and people were writing about it, in uh, about uh, their beliefs, about how Eve really did the right thing in being antinomian. And here's what I found 
on the first time I went to the website was this one. This is somebody speaking about a modern sculpture of Eve. And this is, describes Eve pretty good. She's just not the hero. The desire for the freedom and power to choose for ourselves is as inherent in human beings as breathing. This piece, it's a sculpture of Eve. I didn't give you a picture because it's nude, but I tell you, this lady who, who sculpted it, she's got some real skill in uh, like those old uh, Renaissance pieces of cutting in stone with things. You know, how can you do that? Um, but but it's, a, it's a piece of... <laughs> I don't see how they can make that, that stuff. It's, un, it's incredible to me. I, you know, they didn't, you know, they didn't have power tools. This, is, this piece, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. Well, I, I, when I was building my house, I had this guy, these two guys from Troutman. They came down and did the, the, uh, the framing of my house, not the framing, the, 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 the um, boxing and, the, and, the, and that work and, and, uh, and the stairs and that sort of thing in the house. And, and he had gone to this tour, uh, one of them had gone to a tour that weekend and looked at some old houses from, uh, from the Civil War period, some of these plantation houses. And the guy was completely dumbfounded by the quality of the work. He said, you should have seen those stairs, Robert. I said, you should have seen those stairs. You should have, you should have seen that, that crown mold. It's unbelievable. Like it. And they didn't have power tools. <laughs> We're so excited about it. power to choose for ourselves is inherent in human beings as breathing. This piece, this statue of Eve, gives a new perspective on the biblical story of the fall of man from grace in the Garden of Eden. Rather than relying on blind obedience to externally imposed structures, this powerful gest- in, in this powerful gesture, Eve is knowingly and willingly choosing to choose right from wrong. There's your antinomianism. Good from evil for herself. And that's what antinomians do at the end of the day, is it not? Surely it is. And then it goes on. With this, she also willingly accepts the consequences of her decisions. I don't know if Eve would be so quick to, to, to be happy about that. This piece represents the moment of choosing with Eve and the serpent acting as partners in her transformation into a fully realized human being. Well, now Satan Satan thought he had success over Eve. He had some real success over this guy. (laughs) He's still at work. You said God is still at work. Satan's still at work (laughs) in powerful ways. (laughs) <laughs> I know, it really is. I couldn't have asked for a better one, I think, um, a, a better example. But there were examples like that all the time when I was in that school because, because they actually saw Eve as the hero of the story of Garden, uh, of Garden of Eden, that she did that. She stepped out. We would not be human today if she had not been bold and brave against this law, this external law. See, now, that, that externally imposed structure, that's what you call, the, what she called, what this person calls, the, the commandment that the loving, loyal husband gave to his favorite people in all the whole world so they would love him more. Externally, uh, external uh, imposed structures. So that's, that's how he says now. And then, and then here's, the, here's the thing that, that goes on with this. And this is something, like I said, may take a little getting used to. And we'll have time to get used to it because we're just starting it today. But this antinomian, this is Boston in the marrow of modern divinity about this kind of thing going on in Genesis. The beginning as a legalist and becoming an antinomian. Beginning doubting the word of God and, and trying to add to it whatever we do with legalism uh, and, and the many, many facets and ways of thinking about, about, uh, about legalism and ending up as antinomians. And this is what Boston says. This antinomian principle that it is needless for a man perfectly justified by faith to endeavor to keep the law and do good works is a glaring evidence 
that legality is so ingrained in man's corrupt nature that until a man truly come to Christ by faith, the legal disposition will still be reigning in him. Let him turn himself into what shape or be of what principles he will in religion. Though he run into antinomian, he will carry along with him his legal spirit, which will always be a slavish and unholy spirit. He is constrained, as the author observes, to do all that he does for fear of punishment and hope of reward. And if, that, and if it is once fixed in his mind that these are ceased in his case, he stands like a clock when the weights that have made her go are removed, or like a slave when he is no hazard of the whip, than that which is, cannot be a greater evidence of his loathsome legality. He, um, he becomes, he becomes um, bitter in his service to Christ. Now, uh, we, have, we have just a few minutes, and I, I wanted to go over one more with you very quickly that uh, Ferguson does. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Yes. Right. Right. Going one to the other. And see, this is this is what the theme is going to be developed. This is what Maury wants to come out in this, and this, where he's developing. He's, he's he's just now laying the ground for it. And that antinomian and legalism, even the marrow presents them as he says, "I'm trying to find a middle way between these two." And what uh, and what uh, Boston has said here, and what uh, and what Ferguson is teaching here, is that both antinomianism. The live as you please, no more restraints for people in the gospel, and legalism, adding to the word of God, um, keeping your good, good works to add to your justification or add to your sanctification for any reason whatsoever. These come from the same source. That's what he's trying to chases it back to, to Genesis. They're not opposites. They come from the same, same thing. They're different, they're different ways to express the same kind of rebellion that people have. And then he turns us to this one, which is one of the best examples of it. And I think we've got enough time to do it, and I'll take you through it very quickly. And then we'll dismiss and have a wonderful day eating un uh, until we uh, can't eat anymore. <clears throat> Let's see here. I immediately turned to the wrong book. All right, this is, uh, this is something that you're familiar with, and I will, I'm going to do it by starting with Luke 15, 1. This is parable of the two lost sons, and many of you will be familiar with that particular parable. And it's a parable which shows this, this uh, uh, antinomianism and legalism acting in the same person, uh, just like we saw in Eve. Um, but it starts in 15.1. He's going to tell this parable, but it's really three parables. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. This man receives sinners and eats with them. And so one of those parables is the parable of the prodigal son. Over there in Luke 15, uh, 11. And, Je and Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into the far country, and there he squandered his property, property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. 
But when he, when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I'll arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you and, and bef uh, heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, sonship, and, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older brother was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. <clears throat> and he called one of the servants and asked what, was, what, what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed, it, and killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might sell him, who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was befitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So what's happening with the, with the, the prodigal? What, what does he do? Is who, who mentioned having to do something about our situation? Well, he's, he's in this situation where he, he's living in this home and he doesn't want to live in this home anymore because he doesn't like it. He's, he's, maybe he, he doesn't like be the second son. I don't know. But he doesn't like his father, and neither does the elder brother. But the way he can get out is to go on his own. So he takes his inheritance and goes out and squanders it. He didn't mean to squander it, but the circumstances made him squander it. He's the, he's the quintessential antinomian. I'm not going to live here in this house and take commands from them any longer. I'm going to go out there and live the way I want to live myself and do what I want to do. And he fell flat on his face. And then what does he do? He came to himself. What does it mean that he came to himself? He saw the error of his ways. And what did he say? Here, he becomes the quintessential legalist. I know what I'll do. I'll go back to that scoundrel and I'll work my way back into his good graces and I'll, I'll be a hired hand and I'll work and I'll do these things. That's what, uh, that's what he said. And so he becomes a legalist. So he goes in, the, will the father have anything to do with him being a legalist? No, he can't get it out. Now, here's the thing. He might, some people say that, that the, he came to his senses that he repented. Did he repent? No, he didn't repent. If he repented, his repentance was a legal repentance, as John, John, uh, Cahoon would say, John Cahoon would say. It was a legal repentance. It was a repentance, an evangelical repentance, because he was going to go back and slave. I hate living there, but it's the only way I'm going to get food. I'm going to go back and I'm going to do what I have to do to get food and save my life. And that's what he did. It was a legal repentance, if it was a repentance at all. And he goes back to there, and his father would have nothing to do with it. Bring the rose, kill the fattened calf. Pure grace. Just immeasurable grace for this, this son who did it. And he, was, he puts a ring on his finger and bells on his toe and he will make music wherever he goes. He is, he, is the great, he is the great son returned home. And he's given that status, even though he's a scoundrel. What, is, what happens in the case of the elder brother? What does he do? When the brother comes home, what does he say? It ain't fair. It ain't fair. Right. And what you see here is something that, that Ferguson will take up later on called grace expose. Um, he has several parables in there that when God's magnanimous grace is shown in, in, in uh, uh, countercultural ways, it brings out the legality in your heart. Let me tell you an example I'd use. When I was coming along in, in ministry, one of the big deals was, was Jeffrey Dahmer. You remember Jeffrey Dahmer? 
he killed a lot of people and ate them. And there was a, there was a, a word of, a, of an evangelist went and talked to him and said he came to Christ. He came to Christ. Now, did he? I don't know. I have a reason to, to doubt her. Um, um, she said he did, and, and I hope he did. My point is this. I read an article about that, and you know what the guy said? Well, I'll tell you one thing. If Jeffrey Dahmer's in heaven, I'm not going to be there. And I thought, well, that can be arranged. <laughs> But you see, you see how it is. It brings out the legality. He can't stand the fact that that Jeffrey Dahmer would be in heaven because he was such an uh, evil person. Not good like I am. But that's the evil. That's the evil. That is what the, the older son is doing. I've slaved for you all these years and did all these works. Legalist, 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 legalist. But I'm telling you what, at the end of it, the father goes out, come, come into the feast. If that son of yours is in there, I don't want to be there. He wouldn't go. And that's what he said the Pharisees are like. That's why they were in trouble. And so you have this younger son who was an antinomian that goes out there and comes back a legalist and is redeemed and becomes a son. You had this elder brother who represented the Pharisees who was so bent out of shape over God receiving this on you know, prostitutes. Prostitutes was never mentioned except from the elder brother's mouth. See? Adding to the law there, adding to the judgment. But, but, um, and he would have nothing to do with it because he was, he was so legalistic and he becomes so bitter he, doesn't, he can't stand God's grace. Yes? Yeah, Les Mis. Uh, the you know that's coming, that play's coming to the Charlotte Theater. We'll be there. Uh, yeah. So, but the fact that his character literally could not deal with the fact that he's been shown unconditional mercy, yeah. so much so right. that he killed himself to yeah. keep from having to quit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's, that's where, that's where, um, that's where uh, Ferguson is taking us with this with this first lesson on legalism, and I hope you get your gears rolling, maybe a lot of questions, maybe I don't understand this, but like I said at the beginning, it'll all become clear, just hang in there, and it will become clear because he's a good teacher and he lays it out for us all along the way. Who will close us with prayer? Thank you, sir.